going once, going twice, sold. I'm going, I'm going to deal tonight with handout number five, the second page of that. Um, the one that has the picture of the Nazis down at the bottom. <laughs> there is a reason for that picture of those Nazis at the bottom, but uh, um, there's a man I admire there. Um, but uh, we're going to look tonight at uh, Elijah encountering God. Um, I distrust people who uh, tell me about having a vision of God and it's so wonderful, just, uh, it was just so pleasant. When you read the Old Testament and people who encountered God, uh, it's just a vision. It's an overwhelming moment and uh, it's a life-changing moment. Uh, I, I still remember um, Eli Elijah, Isaiah in, in encounter with God in chapter 6, and we're going to look at that a little bit tonight, but uh, he saw God in his temple, um, and he saw, he doesn't describe God, but he describes the seraphim and his encounter in the, the seraphim shouting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and the whole earth is uh, filled with his glory. And I say, sir, oh, it's me. I'm undone. You know, he's just overwhelmed by that moment of encountering God. I don't know um, if that's every moment when someone encounters God, but a lot of biblical moments like that. And I, Elijah is going to have his moment, is it more than a moment with God, and it's going to be, in some ways, a terrifying moment. And um, God's going to talk to him. And uh, whether he likes what God says or not, you'll have to ask Elijah when you get up there. Uh, it, it's one of those things where this is an overwhelming moment. That's the uh, only way I can describe this moment. Now, I'm also going to have a digression. If you look at the sheet, I have a thing called a meditation up on there. Sometimes when you're studying one thing, you can come to a perspective on God, and then it can lead to another thing. And this was, was a life-changing perspective I had on God. And I'll discuss that when we get down there that moment, and I'm there, oh, my, oh, I, oh, my, uh, oh, my. <laughs> so, hey, I, that's nice to know. I can, yeah. But anyway, that, that moment with God uh, for Elijah must have been overwhelming. And I know that God used this passage to help me in ministry, and I've discussed with you several times things God has me doing now besides this. You know, you're an important part of my week, believe it or not. You know, this is, this is my chance to do something for the kingdom of God. But uh, there are other things that God has me doing besides driving my grandkids to school and picking them up, taking them to violin lessons, oh, just things like that. But uh, God has me uh, talking, and I, I think I shared this last week with uh, I have become a minister to ministers, and uh, who knew that they needed ministering? Um, Todd doesn't. He's, he's a good guy. <laughs> uh, but uh, And they minister to me, and th 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 that's a mutual admiration society. Uh, but uh, I also deal with atheists, and uh, I have a list of atheists that I deal with, and this, this passage helped me in dealing with atheists, which is strange. Um, you wouldn't think that, but I, it was a passage in Scripture that was very, very, very helpful. 
And so I'll share that with you tonight, too. And then when we get to hand out six, if we get to hand out six, if not, keep it for next week. And uh, that. So we're going to go to chapter 19. Before we do, I want to have a word of prayer. And I want to have a prayer for the people we, not just me, but that we minister to, that somehow these lessons that we do, whether it's this one or it's a sermon and on Sunday morning or Sunday school, whether these things will help us as we minister to this world, which drastically needs ministering to. And um, I, I want to pray especially for missionaries. Um, my friend Don, who sat somewhere in here, he came with me, the guy that is in Africa. Uh, he does a fabulous work among the Africans, and uh, God has called him to that. And I want to pray that God will strengthen those people. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for the opportunity to first of all speak with you, to offer praise to you, to you the holy God, the God who is invisible to us yet very real to us. We pray, Father, that we would be among the people who advance your kingdom, your rule upon the earth. We know, Father, that many men are disobedient. May you use us to bring men to obedience to the gospel, the obedience of the faith. I pray, Father, for the people we minister to, that we would be effective, and, but that we'd be kind and compassionate to them, knowing that we too once were deceived and bitter, lonely. May you, through us, perform your work. I pray, Father, for uh, especially uh, the missionaries who serve in areas that are quite dangerous. We occasionally face danger, but, Father, we know that daily they face danger. I, I thank you, Father, for introducing me to my friend Don. I just pray for Don at this time that you will bless him. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, um, on your sheet, it said, His Encounter with God at Horeb. And what we're going to look at is God's question. He's going to ask this question twice in the text. Uh, but first of all, when we come to 1 Kings 19, um, I think I misread a number there, 19.9. Uh, I read it as 19.19, and that didn't make sense. Uh, but 19.9, and the word of the Lord came to him. And I just wonder about what tone of voice God uses. Uh, is it stern? What are you doing here, Elijah? Okay. Uh, or was it, what are you doing here, Elijah? And this is one of the things I would te uh, tell preachers, to be preachers when I taught in the uh, Bible college, you've got to figure out what tone of voice you're going to put God with. Don't always put God with the stern voice, and don't always put God with a nice, gentle voice. You know, it, it depends on the text. What are you doing here? I, I prefer to be the inquisitive. What are you doing here? Well, if you remember, Elijah is running from Jezebel. I mean, he called down fire from the sky, killed 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah. And then Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you tomorrow. <laughs> One of my, and he runs. He and a servant. And he stopped and he let the servant go at one place. And then he himself continued another 40 days down into the desert. I was going to draw a map, but I'm, I'm horrible at drawing maps. It would confuse you more than anything else. But uh, he, he continues to the mountain where Moses received the Ten Commandments. And we don't even know where that is. We just know it's 40 days down from the, where he was before. Okay? And God says, when he sees God there, he's in a cave. 
What are you doing here? Now, we ask ourselves, um, what is this text for? Well, I think in one sense, this text is it was for Elijah to say, you've got to pay attention to the God who is everywhere. He's, he's back on Mount Carmel. That was supposedly Baal's site. He was everywhere. He protected you for three years plus, and now you run away, and here I am down here too. What are you doing here? And now notice how he replies. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. Now, if you look on the sheet, I make, known, make note of something. Uh, look at the names he uses for God. Lord, that's his covenant name. That's that name we, that you, they used to translate Jehovah, but it's, uh, that's a hard discussion to explain how they got that. They made a mistake uh, in the, doing the Hebrew, but it's probably something like Yahweh. Um, it's very similar to that phrase, uh, I am who I am. If you remember in Exodus chapter 3, uh, Moses says, hey, what do I say to these people? What, who you are? And you say, I'm Yahweh. Eh, yeah, I share. Uh, yeah. It's sort of like the word, eh, yeah, I am who I am. Or you could translate it, I'll be whoever I'll be. I like that translation. Uh, I, who are you? It's just whatever I want to be. I'll be what I want to be. So he knows the covenant name of God. And then he says, uh, you are the uh, God, and now this translation says God Almighty. Uh, he has the generic word for God, Elohim, meaning the God of gods. And then he uses Almighty, um, which it's the word Sabaoth. I have a hard time pronouncing Hebrew words at sometimes, but it's Sabaoth. It's the God of armies. He, know, he knows his theology. You know, that's, that's what's so weird. We know our theology, but do we believe our theology at times? It's like Jonah. If you remember the story of Jonah. Todd, you preached on Jonah, did you? Yes, I, I thought you, you did. But anyway, Jonah uh, knows that God is the God of the creation, but then he tries to flee and go out to sea. Wait, his theology is God is everywhere, but his practical thing is I can run from him. I'll get out of his presence. No, you don't. You can go all the way to Horeb. You can go to the tip of South Africa or Antarctica, and guess who you would find there if you were a prophet? You, were, you would find God. So he knows his theology that God is the God of armies. And then the question comes up, why do you fear Jezebel? If God's got armies, the hosts, um, and then he talks about his people. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. And he says, I'm the only one who's left. Now, what we're going to learn uh, in the next chapter is God's got other prophets. And a couple chapters later, we, we find out he's got other prophets. God's got other prophets working at the same time, and he's got other people. And if you remember this guy Obadiah from last week, Obadiah hid a hundred of them in a cave. Fifty in one cave, fifty in another cave, but he, he's not the only one. And yet, he thinks, I'm the only one. Um, you see the weakness of men here. We have to remember our theology that we may be weak, but he is strong. Okay, uh, I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, and I like this, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Okay, now this is the important part. The Lord responds 
this way. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. Okay? I've been to those mountains. I climbed up them when I was a young, much younger man. Some of you might try that. I'm not going to. I could come back there. I would hire a guy with a camel. Oh, a camel wouldn't make a donkey. No. I'd carry, hire a guy to carry me up. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it was a, I, I thought at first, oh, this is going to be nothing. And it was. But there's rocks everywhere, and the wind is tearing this mountain apart. But the Lord is not. In the wind. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire or lightning. But the Lord was not in the lightning. Now, why does God want to make this lesson? This is, a, this is the lesson that really helped me in dealing with with atheists. And I'm going to explain this in a minute. It's a really circuitous route that I went with this. But yeah, God has all the powers that quote unquote Baal and his buddies, all those pagan gods are supposed to have. Wind, earthquake, fire. Yeah, they're supposed to have those. God can do those things, but notice what it says. Now, it depends on your translations. I'm going to ask for you to respond. Read your translations. But what does, how does God respond? And after the fire came what? What is your translation? Gentle whisper. That's the NIV version. What? Oh, I didn't hear you. Soft whisper. Yeah. Or King James Version, still small voice. Yeah. What? Gentle blowing, yeah. Yeah. He, I, don't, I don't know how to imitate an earthquake or lightning. Maybe wind. <laughs> but what is God? He's not just power. He's something more. When he wants to reveal himself to Elijah, that's one way to translate it. Um, thin whisper could be translated. Something gentle. So how do you read that? What are you doing here, Elijah? Or, what am I doing? But at this point, he reveals something about himself. Now, I, I, sometimes my mind, I know, works in strange ways. Uh, sometimes you run an encounter with somebody, and a text will speak to you in a different way. Now, I'm not claiming this was from God or what. Maybe it was. I don't know. But uh, I was dealing with a, a question. And I get asked this question many times. Mr. Dyke? I always like, or Professor Dyke? <laughs> you know, you know you're in trouble when they, when they start that way. Mr. Dyke? Um, if God is loving and powerful, then why does he allow evil to exist? And my answer, that is not my God. But a caricature, or as my British friend says, a caricature, is a twisting of my view of God. God is not just loving and not just power. Let's be strong with this. He's not just that. Um, in argumentation, that's called begging the question. Now, I know there are about five uses of that phrase, begging the question, but begging the question is where you phrase the question 
I'll ask Todd this. Where you phrase the question to allow for only one conclusion, one answer. Todd, do you still beat your wife? <laughs> Wait, better yet, does your wife still beat you? <laughs> You know, what did I do with that? Well, I, I framed the question so that I can only have one question, answer. Todd beats his wife. Well, Todd doesn't beat his wife, I don't think. <laughs> she seems to talk to him without fear. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's, what, that's what they're doing. They're, uh, they're limiting our view of God to just power, and love. Well, come on. God is much more than that. Um, I have a friend who is an atheist, and um, he listened to my take on this, and he told me that I have one of the best ways of dealing with this question. He teaches religion. He has a PhD in religion. He's an atheist, but he has a PhD. So much for degrees, right? But uh, I love the man because uh, he's, he's an honest man. He's, um, uh, he listens to you and that, and I have to listen to him. But this is what I, I do with this question. How can God? And take this for what you will, but how can God... And I studied mathematics once in my life before I was a Christian, and then I studied logic once I became a Christian. And how can God, who is A, now what is A? Everything that God is. And you start listing the attributes of God. How can a God who is omnipotent, I start with what they do, powerful, right? How can God, who is omnipotent, if, if he wants to do something, he can do it. If he wants to create a universe, he can create a universe. And that's why I like, one of the things I like about science, I, I like to look at the universe to see how immense this thing is because that says something to me about my God. Um, now, but he's also intelligent, um omniscient, he knows all things, uh, but he's all, and that includes he, he does things that are logical, and he, when I at, talk to atheists, I've talked to people, and they've given up with me, like one person said, oh. well, if you ask the question that way, there is no problem, because you, you take all these things about God and say, they're a person. It's not just a list of attributes. It's a person. Maybe not, it's not flesh and blood like you and me, but the great spirit. God is a spirit. And it's integrated. So, well, can God make a, uh, a rock too big for him to live? No, God doesn't do stupid things. He doesn't do things that are illogical to him. You've got to have an attribute of God in his intelligence that he's logical. Well, can God arm wrestle himself and make his right hand? No. Can God make a rock too big for him? To, he doesn't do the illogical. Um, my favorite one that, I, that an atheist asked me once, can God make an unstoppable force run into an impenetrable, I can't do that word, impenetrable, immovable object. God doesn't do the stupid. You know, he do, what he does is, ra is intelligent, is rational. God can do anything that is logical to him. Not logical to you, but to him. Well, this guy who asked the unstoppable force, I said, yeah, and he'll put your head right between them. You know, the guy didn't like that. that. Was my cruder days? Okay. Well, anyway, um, 
the atheist asked why his question is invalid, I explained to him, God is not John Coffey. I don't know. I don't think I spelled coffee right. John Coffey is that uh, character out of the Green Mile who was big and strong and loving. Yeah, if you've seen the Green Mile, God is not John Coffey. God is more than John Coffey. And let me, let me list all of his attributes that I know and tell you there are more than I know. The attributes are descriptions of a person. And why, how did I get this out of my text about Elijah? Well, we'd be tempted to say, well, God is the God of thunder. God is the God of earthquake. God is the God of wind. God is the God of fire. But he's more than that. There's an attribute of him that is much different than what he has displayed. He, w he can do those things, but that's not his main attribute. And that's what I think God is saying to Elijah. I'm more than just a storm God, an earthquake God. There are aspects to my being, is what God would say, that you don't understand. If you look in verse 13 with me, I'm going to get off that. That's something I was felt compelled to do. Um, in verse 13, when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Let's put the still small voice in there. What are you doing here, Elijah? And he sounds like a broken record. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken your altars. Turn the page, Dan. Put your prophets to death with the sword, and I'm the only one left. Now they're trying to kill me too. I wonder how, if God thinks that we're thick-headed. You know, did you get this, Elijah? But then what he's going to do, he's, God's going to give him a commission. Now, he's given give him a threefold commission. He's going to start with two things that we have a hard time explaining. Uh, verses, go back the way you came. If I were Elijah, I'd ask exactly the way I came. I have to go past Jezebel. Well, maybe. Um, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also, Anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. Now, wait, Ahab is the king in Israel, but the prophet is to anoint a new king. This would, should be death for Elijah, and it should be death for Jehu. And then he says, anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, from Avel Maholah, I got to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael. So he's going to have the Syrian be made king of Syria, Damascus. And he is going to have Jehu made king of Israel. And they're going to do in these people. Elisha will be... Will uh, and Elisha will put to death any who escape from the sword of Jehu. Okay, now, he has threefold commission there. Now, if you look in 2 Kings chapter 8, verses, okay, let's go over to 2 Kings chapter 8. get there eventually. Um, verses 7 through 15. 
Now pay attention to the names. Elisha went to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, was ill. When the king was told, the man of God has come all the way up here, he said to Hazael, take a gift with you and go meet the man of God. Consult Yahweh through him. Ask him, will I recover from this illness? Hazael went to meet Elisha, taking with him as a gift 40 camel loads. Wow of all the finest wares of Damascus. Uh, That's a lot of stuff. Uh, He went in and stood before him and said, Your son, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, that's Assyria, has sent me to ask, will I recover from this illness? Elisha answered, I have a problem with this. It sounds like a lie. Go and say to him, you will certainly recover. But the Lord has revealed to me that he will, in fact, die. He stared at him with a fixed gaze until Haziel felt ashamed when the man of God began, then the man of God began to weep. It's a rather strange scene, isn't it? Why is my Lord weeping, asked Haziel? Because I know the harm you will do to the Israelites, he answered. You will set fire to their fortified places, kill their young men with a sword, dash their little children to the ground, and rip open their pregnant women. Haziel said, How could your servant, a mere dog, which that's really an insult <laughs> to call yourself a dog, um, accomplish such a feat? The Lord has shown me that you'll become king of Aram. Elisha answered Elisha. When Haziel left, Elisha returned to his master. When Hadad asked, what did Elisha say to you? Haziel replied, he told me that you would certainly recover. But the next day, he took a thick cloth, soaked in water, and spread it over the king's face so that he died. Then Haziel succeeded him as king. Now, that first commission to Elijah wasn't done by Elijah. It was done by Elisha. What is... See, it hinges on that third one. You will anoint. He did it, but through someone else. So the prophecy is fulfilled, but in a way that you don't expect. And then the the other one is uh, you will anoint Jehu, king of Israel. And this is in chapter 9. Chapter 9 of 2 Kings, verses 1 through 13. The prophet Elisha summoned the man from the company of the prophets and said, Tuck your cloak into your belt, take your flask of oil with you to remote Gilead. When you get there, look for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, Go to him, get him away from his companions, and take him into an inner room. Then take the flask and pour the oil on his head and declare, This is what the Yahweh says, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and run, don't delay. And you can read the rest of that section. So the, uh, the second of these things he's supposed to do is also done by Elisha. So... But it's not done really by Elisha, it's done by someone else, Elisha. But it's the ministry of Elijah, and it's something that Elijah was commanded to get done. We don't have all the story here. Okay, now, the third thing uh, is you must anoint Elisha as a prophet. This is chapter 19, verse 19. Getting the right kings, Dan. First Kings, yeah. yeah. First Kings chapter 19, verse 19. So Elijah, we're back to Elijah, went from there, found Elisha, the son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. 
and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. So he's probably got workers, uh, what is it, plowing time. Um, running a rototiller is hard enough, you know that. And when I was a kid, we I was allowed to do the plow once. I'd screwed up so bad, my grandfather said, get off that tractor, you know. Anyway, um, Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. He knew what that meant. You, 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 he threw the prop. So he's making him his disciple. Um, we don't understand some of these customs, but if you remember in the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus invites some guys to come and follow me. Where, where do you live? Come and see. What's he doing? Well, he's saying, you can be my disciple. And by putting, I should have worn a coat tonight, but I didn't. Uh, I, would, I would anoint Todd as my, <laughs> I'm not a prophet. But, you know, throw the coat around, a cloak around him. That makes him the prophet of God. Okay. Um, but he, he realizes the immensity of this thing. And I, I like the. I, I, this sounds weird. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye. He said, and then I'll come with you. Elijah said, okay, go back. What, I, what have I done to you? Well, he, you, he's done something immense to him. Um, I, I remember uh, studying Je the prophet Jeremiah. And my teacher that I had at that time had written extensively about the prophet Jeremiah. One of the best courses I've ever had in school was Jeremiah. And I remember this guy, I can't imitate him directly, but just couldn't keep up with him. Jeremiah was talking about, this guy was talking about Jeremiah's view of the false prophets. And he said, these guys couldn't be a false, they couldn't be a prophet. Because anybody that wants to be a prophet can't be a prophet because I'm a prophet and I don't want to be a prophet. And anyone that wants to be a prophet couldn't be a prophet. You know, no one wants to be a prophet. It's like Jesus said in Matthew 23, which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute and kill? You know, which of them? And this is... Uh, I don't know what Elijah meant, but what have I done to you? I read that in the light of those other texts and saying, oh, something has been done to this. Then Elijah, Elisha left him, went back. He took his yoke of oxen, slaughtered them. Wow. He burned the plow equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his attendant. Let's go. The only one of these three things that Elijah does directly is get Elisha. Now, that will be a different story. Elisha, Elisha's a, I, I, like, I mentioned last week he was bald, and Baal worshipers respected hairy guys. You, you, I got hair, but not everywhere. But Baal is supposedly the one thing, I don't have this one, but there's one uh, thing with him, picture, uh, uh, carving, and he, he's just a hairy guy, uh, and um, you, you're old enough, some of you are old enough to remember the song, I'm such a hairy guy, I'm hairy morning, noon, and night, nighty, night, night. Well, that would be Baal, but Elijah is bald. Power doesn't rest in having hair, right, Todd? <laughs> I got to pick on him. Um, uh so, Elijah is going to be his attendant. Now, um, if you look, oh, come on, Dan. I, I want to go back in the text. Jehu will be put to death. Verse 18, yet I reserve 7,000. A lot of people are going to die. They're unfaithful. 
not just unfaithful, but despicable people. I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Now, what was it Elijah was kept saying? I'm the only one left. Well, he met Obadiah. I'm the only one left. Obadiah hid a hundred prophets in caves. I'm the only one left. You know, he's got this refrain, I'm, I'm the only one left. God said, no, there are 7,000 people. Now, that's not a lot. But notice what unfaithfulness was. Okay, he lists two things that a good person doesn't do. Have not bowed down to Baal and have not kissed him. I'm going to do a dangerous thing. I've made up my mind. <laughs> okay. You've got to help me up if I can't get up, okay? <laughs> One of the, in the ancient world, and this goes all the way up to the time of Jesus, one of the ways of showing submission to God or to your overlord is not just to bow like this, but it was to kiss the ground in front of your master. This is even, there's one place in the New Testament where, hey, <laughs> old man got up. There's one place in the New Testament, the wise men who came to visit Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, they bow before him, but they do, they, they use the Greek word that means to bow and kiss the ground. Um, and this was an ancient thing. It went way before Jesus. If you go to the book of Psalms, uh, let's turn over to the book of Psalms. Psalm number two. This is one of the things that we call a messianic psalm. A psalm about the Christ, about the Messiah. Psalm two. Okay, now this psalm is a little bit complex psalm. Uh, it has a variety of parts. I don't know if various singers, you know, the psalms are songs. They would sing in the, in the temple. And this is what we call a messianic psalm. Um, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his. And then notice who they are plotting against, his anointed one. Now, kings were anointed, prophets were anointed, priests were anointed, but this became a view of what the Messiah, the Christ, would be. This is the word Mashiach, the word we would translate into Greek, Christos, which we translate in English, Christ, against the Lord and against his anointed. And here's what people were saying. Let us break their chains. They say, throw off their fetters. The one who enthroned in heaven laughs. Now, this is one of the few places where you have God laughing. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's a laugh like, ha-ha, <laughs> or, ho, 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 ho. Um, the Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Mount Zion, my holy mountain. And you can study this in the book of Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, um, we see that the... In, with the coming of the Christ. Mount Zion is not just the city of Jerusalem, but it's the heavenly Mount Zion, and Christ has been enthroned. How can any of these things, how can, let's say, Mr. Putin do anything again? He can rebel, but he can't take out the Christ. Well, if you go down to verse um, 10, it says, Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. And if you, and I like the NIV version at this point. It says, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way. Um, 
for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So what is this thing of kissing? It's the ultimate way of either the ground, but if you're a pagan, you kiss the statue of your pagan god. And uh, I remember uh, this one guy that I highly respect, a biblical scholar, talking about Isaiah chapter 6. If you remember when Isaiah saw God, we covered a little bit of this earlier. He said, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, living among a people of unclean lips. What does he mean? Does it mean I have kissed the Baals? I have kissed these pagan statues? And I'm not falling. Don't worry. If I do, Todd has to pick me up. <laughs> but, any, but anyway, does he kiss? Has he, what is it? Does, does it just mean, oh, I, I've said bad words? Okay, well. <laughs> I bet a lot of us have said bad words. But it doesn't mean something greater than that. I've kissed these pagan things. I don't know. But um, a good man is a man who has not bowed before Baal, and a good man is not one who has kissed him. You know, now... What does it mean to be faithful? I put a picture at the bottom of the page, one of my favorite pictures. I run into it every so often, sometimes at this time of year. This is a picture taken in Nazi Germany. I have a friend, well, had a friend, she's dead now, Waldtraut. Waldtraut, and I don't know her maiden name, but Coleman. She married an American soldier uh, who was stationed in Germany at the close of the war. And uh, he opened one of the concentration camps and set the prisoners free. But I remember her talking, and she said, not every, not every German liked Hitler. Not every German liked Hitler. But we all stood in fear, okay, of Hitler. And if you did anything that would cast suspicion, you could be put in a concentration camp. Her aunt came to her brother's house one day, and she had a stack of clothing. And she said to her brother, Wally's dad, your children will join the Hitler Youth. And her dad said, no. And she said, unless you say yes, tomorrow there will be a man at your door, and you will be arrested. You'll go to a concentration camp. and I will take and raise your children. Sometimes we have hard things. This picture of this man, her dad begrudgingly said yes, but then every night when she would come home from her Hitler Youth meeting, he would tell her why this is all wrong. You look at the picture, this was taken, and I, I read that, I don't know if this is true, but this supposedly they found this among the Nazi things, and the Nazis drew the circle. Notice everybody in the picture is going like this, Heil Hitler, act of allegiance, right? Notice the one guy. Supposedly, he was arrested. I don't know whatever became of him. I just read one time that he was arrested. 
just a simple act of crossing your arms. Maybe it was not nothing to uh, bow down and say, okay, I'll kiss the ground in front of Baal or I'll kiss this statue. It's just a statue. No, there are 7,000 people who did not do that act of allegiance to the, this system that Jezebel set up. She resisted that. No, she re- he, he resi- they, they resisted that. Uh, this man resisted it, uh, to, and he paid the price. Sometimes God calls us to resist evil things. And that's what Elijah and Elisha, Elisha will do, Elijah has done. But also, there are 7,000 people whose life was at stake. It was in line to be, they were in line to be killed. No. Remember Obadiah, the guy who was Ahab's servant. That man took his life and he left his life in the hands of whatever. He hid a hundred prophets. He fed them. He probably had assistance. I don't think he could carry on the the food and bread and water for a hundred people, but he had assistance. And we know there are 7,000 people who have not submitted to this. We are all constantly facing this thing of, will we submit to evil? Now, I didn't say the government. I said to evil. If the government is evil, then I resist the government. If it's evil powers, we have to not bow the knee. I bow to one person. If I saw him... I would bow before the Lord Jesus and I would kiss the dirt. And I'm always reminded of these um, magi who came to see Jesus. What a privilege. People said, what were they? They were probably what we call Zoroastrians, um, magi, and very powerful men. If you read that story, they walk into Jerusalem And everybody's afraid, even Herod. Everybody's afraid. But then, when they come to the Lord Jesus, they give him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They surrender the tools and the the, uh, pay for their trade. Magi are considered sorcerers. Uh, It's the same word that's used of Simon Magus in the New Testament, who was a sorcerer. But these men surrendered to Jesus and kissed the dirt. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that in this life that we would be faithful to Jesus. When the time of testing comes, O God, we pray that we would realize that we only serve one king and We pray, Father, that we would not bow before the powers that be, before that evil that so easily besets us, and that we would be faithful to the point of death. I thank you, God, that you give to those who are faithful the crown of life. I thank you for the martyrs who have gone before. I pray your blessing upon them. We know, Father, that you are blessing them in the eternal state, and I thank you for that. Um, We we pray your blessing upon the prophets. Um, We pray your blessing on Elijah and Elisha and all these unnamed prophets. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Christ, the King, the prophet, and the priest. In the name of Jesus, amen. Bring back handout six. I'll give you handout seven next week, too.